Hello and welcome. You're watching World Panorama, where we take a closer look at the biggest international news stories that unfolded this week. I'm Ashwarya Kapoor with you. Let us begin the program with the top headlines. Israeli lawmakers vote to dissolve parliament after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu fails to form a coalition government following April polls. Fresh election to be held on 17th of September. Malaysia to ship back tons of plastic waste to foreign nations, alleges containers stacked with contaminated waste are smuggled to its illegal processing facilities, says won't become a dumping ground for rich nations. UK Prime Minister Theresa May's resignation announcement sets off a fierce competition to succeed her as Conservative Party leader. Ten politicians are throwing their hat in the ring. US President Donald Trump announces tariffs of up to 25% on all Mexican imports. New tariffs begin at a rate of 5% starting 10th of June as Trump administration looks to pressurize Mexico to crack down on migrants attempting to cross the US border. And a record 11 deaths recorded this climbing season at Mount Everest. Climbers allege overcrowding. Nepal says it is considering changing the rules about who was allowed up the world's highest mountain. Our top story is from Israel where the lawmakers voted to dissolve parliament. Now this after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu failed to form a coalition government after parliamentary elections in April. Netanyahu was unable to reach a deal for a fresh right-wing coalition. The dissolution of parliament means that a fresh election will be held that has been now scheduled for 17th of September. It is the first time in Israel's history that a prime minister designate has failed to form a coalition. Israel's parliament voted to dissolve itself on Thursday, sending the country to an unprecedented second snap election this year as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu failed to form a governing coalition before a midnight deadline. Parliament voted 74 to 45 in favour of dissolving itself. Bill of the 21st Parliament dissolution, 74 in favour, 45 against. I determined that the bill was approved in three readings as required. The vote came less than two months after parliamentary elections, in which Netanyahu looked set to capture a fifth consecutive term. His Likud party won 35 of the parliament's 120 seats. Netanyahu entered negotiations to form a coalition government. But infighting among his allies and disagreements over proposed bills to protect Netanyahu from prosecution meant that a majority coalition could not be formed. It is the first time in Israel's history that a prime minister designate has failed to form a coalition. We will run a sharp, clear election campaigning which will bring us victory. We will win, we will win and the public will win. The immediate cause of the crisis was Netanyahu's dispute with Avid Gore Lieberman, a former aide who leads a small faction. He had demanded that the parliament pass a legislation that requires young ultra-orthodox men to be drafted into the military. Both Netanyahu and Lieberman blamed each other for the crisis. The Likud has failed in this task to form a coalition to form a government. Together with their turn to the ultra-Orthodox, they fully bear responsibility to the fact that Israel is now going back once again to election. After failing to form the government, Netanyahu's Likud party did not concede that task to one of the rivals and advanced a bill to dissolve parliament and send the country to the polls for a second time this year. 
had the deadline passed without the vote, Israel's president would have given another lawmaker, most likely opposition leader Benny Gantz, an opportunity to put together a coalition. Gantz accused Netanyahu of choosing self-preservation over national interest. This is all happening for only two words, only two words, legal fortress. There is no other reason here. The country now plunges into a new election campaign that will last at least three months under Israeli law. The campaign looks to complicate Netanyahu's precarious legal standing. Israel's Attorney General has recommended pressing criminal charges against him in three separate corruption cases, pending a hearing scheduled for October. Netanyahu, who is on course to become Israel's longest-serving Prime Minister in July, will now remain in power until September's vote. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Malaysia has ordered several thousand tons of imported plastic waste to be sent back to the countries it came from. The country's government says it has become a dumping ground for wealthier nations and that much of the refuse was imported illegally. Malaysia became the world's main destination for plastic waste after China banned its import last year. But Malaysia now says it will fight back. Malaysia has refused to become a dumping ground for the world's trash. The country will return 3,000 tonnes of contaminated plastic waste to the countries that shipped it. Nine shipping containers at Port Kelang, west of Kuala Lumpur on Tuesday were found to contain mislabeled plastic and non-recyclable waste, including a mixture of household and e-waste. Malaysia says the US, UK, Canada, Japan, China, Saudi Arabia, Bangladesh, Netherlands and Singapore should expect waste products to be returned. We are compiling the list of the so-called recycling companies from this developed country and we will send back, send the list of these uh, names of these companies to the respective governments to take uh, to take further actions against uh, an investigation for this, uh, these companies in their respective countries. It is not the first time that Malaysia has taken such a decision. Five containers of waste were returned to Spain last month. It was in April this year that Malaysia launched a joint task force to crack down on the growing problem of illegal plastic waste imports. The issue has become more precarious after China banned plastic waste imports last year that caused a ripple effect through global supply chains, middlemen looking for new destinations for their trash, including Malaysia. Malaysians, like any other developing countries, have a right to clean air, clean water, sustainable resources and clean environment to live in, just like citizens of developed nations. The row over plastic waste imports is also playing out in the Philippines. Philippines and Canada have been logged in a diplomatic standoff for the last six years, after shipping containers filled with household waste were mistakenly sent to a port in the Philippines. The company responsible is no longer in business, and both governments have argued over how it should be returned and who should pay. Canada recently missed a 15th of May deadline to take back tons of its garbage. That prompted a diplomatic spat, with Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte recalling his ambassador to Ottawa. Duterte said he was prepared to declare war on Canada over the issue, after which Canadian government pledged that the garbage will be brought back before the end of June. That order of the recall is to persuade them to make it fast. The more they delay, the more personal will be coming back. I wish you the statement on pa that the refusal to bring the garbage back to their shores is disruptive. That's what the word I use, disruptive of our diplomatic relations. As the usage of plastic grows throughout the world, countries are struggling on how to deal with the plastic waste. 
Last year, the governments of 187 countries, including Malaysia, agreed to add plastic to the Basel Convention, a treaty that regulates the movement of hazardous materials from one country to another. Your report, Rajya Sabha TV. And the race for the keys to the 10 Downing Street has started. Now, there are 10 contenders to replace Theresa May as Prime Minister. Now, May says that she will formally resign as the leader of the governing Conservative Party on 7th of June. And the process to choose her successor is on. The party leader will automatically become the Prime Minister. The fate of Brexit, that is uh, Britain's plans to leave the European Union, are already at the heart of uh, early campaigning. Remember, Britain is uh, scheduled to end its membership of the bloc on 31st of October, more than three years after people voted in a referendum to leave the European Union. The race to become the next leader of the Conservative Party and consequently the next UK Prime Minister has begun to accelerate, with the first round of voting set to take place in the first week of June. Whoever wins will have the task of trying to deliver Brexit after a political deadlock and three failed parliamentary votes that helped bring down Theresa May, who resigned as leader on Friday. Outgoing Prime Minister Theresa May says it was best for Britain to leave the European Union in an orderly way with a divorce agreement. The position I've always taken has been to work to get the best possible deal for the UK in leaving the EU. I've always taken the view that the best option for the UK is to leave the European Union with a deal. I'm not going to comment on the views of individual candidates. There will be a process of selecting my successor as leader of the Conservative Party, uh, but I continue to have the view that it's best for the UK to leave with a deal. Here is a look at the Conservative lawmakers who are vying for power through the prism of Britain's withdrawal from the EU. Boris Johnson He is one of Britain's most globally prominent politicians, being former Foreign Secretary and Mayor of London. He had participated in Conservative leadership contest in 2016, but prematurely ended it that paved the way for Theresa May to enter Downing Street. Dominic Raab the former minister was tasked with handling Brexit negotiations for May after his predecessor, David Davis, resigned. Raab stayed in the role for a little more than four months before he also quit in protest at the deal May finally struck with the EU. Andrea Leedsom. She resigned as leader of the House of Commons for reasons relating to UK's departure from the European Union and is also one of the top contenders. Esther McVeigh. The former Work and Pensions Secretary under May also resigned, claiming that the Prime Minister's negotiated Brexit deal did not honour the result of the 2016 referendum. Sajid Javid, a former Managing Director at Deutsche Bank, Javid is the first member of an ethnic minority to serve as Home Secretary and is one of the key contenders. Matt Hancock, the Minister responsible for Britain's health and social service system, he has previously worked as an economist at the Bank of England. Michael Gove. He was one of the most high-profile Brexit supporters during the 2016 referendum and is in the top leadership race. Jeremy Hunt. He is the current Foreign Secretary. Also in the race are Rory Stewart. He is International Development Secretary and Kit Malthouse, the minister currently responsible for housing. However, many Tory leadership candidates are warning that Conservative Party will be committing political suicide if it tries to push through a no-deal Brexit no deal on the table but I just think we have to be careful about saying that we will definitely leave the EU on a fixed date deal or no deal because the risk of that is that Parliament would then try and stop a no deal Brexit which they've already done successfully before and then you would be pushed into a general election and uh, I think if that happened the Conservative Party would be annihilated because we went into the last election promising to deliver Brexit we won't have delivered it by this election if it happened. And so I think the crucial thing is to find a way to get... The UK's departure from EU was pushed back to 31st of October after the country missed the previous deadline of 29th of March. The official race to be Conservative Party leader gets underway in early June after Theresa May stands down, but jostling between candidates has already begun. The winner, expected to be named by late July, will also become the Prime Minister. 
ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट राज्यसभा टीवी And US President Donald Trump announced on Thursday that he will impose tariffs on Mexican goods beginning 10th of June unless the country does more to help reduce illegal immigration from Central America. Trump says that initially the US is slapping a 5% tariff and the percentage will increase gradually up to 25% until the illegal immigration problem is remedied. It is noteworthy that Donald Trump has already declared a national emergency to tackle what he claims is a crisis at the US southern border with Mexico. The sudden tariff threat comes even as the Trump administration has been pushing for the passage of a US Mexico Canada agreement that would update the North American Free Trade Agreement or NAFTA. In a latest anti-immigration measure, US President Donald Trump announced tariffs on all goods coming from Mexico. In a tweet, Trump said that from 10th of June, a 5% tariff would be imposed and would slowly rise until the illegal immigration problem is remedied. Trump made the announcement by tweet after telling reporters on Thursday that he was planning a major statement that would be his biggest so far on the border. We have brought something to the light of the people. They see now it's a national emergency and most people agree. The Democrats agree too, but they won't give us the legislation you need to fix it. Right now when you catch somebody you have to release them. They won't give us the legislation whether it's chain migration or whether it's lottery, they won't give us any and the asylum procedures are ridiculous. No place in the world has what we have. in terms of ridiculous immigration laws During his election campaign and throughout his time in office President Trump has sought funds to build a wall on the US Mexico border He declared a national emergency in February in an attempt to divert federal funds for a barrier wall but a judge blocked his efforts in May The White House says the president would use the International Emergency Economic Powers Act to implement the new tariffs on Mexico Mexico has said it wants to avoid confrontation with the US. Mexico is known for agricultural products like avocados, but the country is also a major manufacturing hub and home to many US companies. Residents of Mexico City expressed doubt that President Trump's tariff threat would do anything to stop the flow of migrants through Mexico. I think it's dangerous for both countries. because there is definitely a very strong commercial relationship between them and i don't think it's something that's convenient for either nation since mexico needs us industry just like us industry needs mexican labor trump has accused the mexican government of failing to do enough to crack down on the surge of central american migrants who have been flowing to the us in search of asylum from countries including El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala. While Trump has been adamant on building a border wall, the Democrat controlled House of Representatives is taking legal action to halt the Trump administration's efforts, saying it would be a waste of funds and would not stop illegal immigration. Critics also say that border agents are taking a heavy-handed approach under the Trump administration to control migration at the US-Mexico border. pointing to the deaths of six migrant children in the US custody since September Bureau report Rajesh Bhatti And here is a look at some more international news stories in Global Buzz Papua New Guinea has appointed a new prime minister after weeks of political upheaval. Lawmakers voted overwhelmingly to elect James Marape, a former finance minister who resigned in April in protest against a gas project. His appointment comes after the outgoing leader Peter O'Neill resigned on Wednesday. O'Neill faced calls for his resignation for weeks and was finally pressurized into stepping down. The ex-prime minister's leadership was put under pressure by a series of political defections in recent days and tensions over a multi-billion dollar gas project that was signed this year with a French company.
Talks between government and opposition representatives aimed at resolving Venezuela's political crisis have ended without any agreement. The talks in Norway were the first between the two sides since National Assembly Speaker Juan Guaido declared himself as interim leader in January, arguing that President Nicolas Maduro's re-election was fraudulent. Despite the lack of a progress, both sides said that they wanted to continue the talks. However, no date has been set for a next round. Julian Assange was too ill to appear at his court hearing in London, his lawyer has said. The WikiLeaks founder is fighting against being extradited to the United States over charges related to leaking US government secrets. He had been due to appear at his case management hearing via video link from a prison, but a lawyer said that he was not very well. The US Justice Department has charged Assange with receiving and publishing thousands of classified documents linked to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the captain of a vessel that collided with a tour boat on the Danube River in Budapest, resulting in at least seven deaths, has been arrested. The 64-year-old Ukrainian national was held as a suspect over reckless misconduct in waterborne traffic leading to mass casualties. The boat carrying South Korean tourists sank seven seconds after the collision during a rainstorm on Wednesday. Hopes have faded that any of the 21 people missing will be found alive. A criminal investigation has been launched into the collision. Scaling Mount Everest was a dream few realized before Nepal opened its side of the mountain to commercial climbing a half century ago. Now this year the Nepalese government issued a record number of permits leading to traffic jams on the world's highest peak that likely contributed to the greatest death toll in four years. The death toll for the 2019 climbing season has been 11 people so far. As the allure of Mount Everest grows, uh, so have the crowds, with inexperienced climbers uh, faltering at the narrow passageway to the peak and causing deadly delays. Napoli mountaineer Kami Rita Sherpa returning to a hero's welcome in Kathmandu. Sherpa last week climbed Mount Everest for a record 24th time. This was her second ascent in just one week. It is this thrill of climbing the world's highest peak of reaching the pinnacle that attracts veteran mountaineers from around the world every year. However, 2019 has been one of the deadliest seasons. On Monday, an American, Christopher John Coolidge, died after reaching the top of Everest, bringing the death toll for this climbing season to 11 people. People are taking Everest easily or getting lightly, but it's not an easy mountain, so they end up killing themselves. So Everest is not an easy mountain, it's a big mountain. The problem hasn't been avalanches, blizzards or high winds. Mountaineers have suggested a lack of experience and the growing commercialization of expeditions as contributing factors. British climber Robin Haynes Fisher was one of those who had warned of the dangers of overcrowding. He died after suffering from what appeared to be altitude sickness while returning from the summit on Saturday. During the week beginning 20th of May, crowds of climbers became stuck in a queue to the summit above the mountain's highest camp at 26,000 feet. Most people can only spend a matter of minutes at the summit without extra oxygen supplies and the area where mountaineers have been delayed is known as the death zone. Lots of people died this year, everyone knows, and it's been a carnage. And I should say it has become a death race there because there was massive traffic jam and people are pushing themselves who are not even capable of doing it. They do it, they try to summit and they instead of summiting they kill themselves. Reports say that fly-by-night adventure companies are taking up untrained climbers who pose a risk to everyone on the mountain. And also, Nepalese government, in order to earn foreign currency, issues more permits than Everest can safely handle. The Nepali government issued a record number of permits, 381 this year, as part of a bigger push to commercialize the mountain. 
they were accompanied by an equal number of guides from Nepal's ethnic Sherpa community. But what I understand is there was too many permits issued and there's too many people up there which obviously needs to be addressed. Obviously if it's not safe for people to go, people shouldn't be going. The last time 10 or more people died on Everest was in 2015 during an avalanche. Once only accessible to well-heeled elite mountaineers, Nepal's booming climbing market has driven down the cost of an expedition, opening Everest up to hobbies and adventure seekers, resulting in overcrowding and deaths and also climbers complaining about heaps of trash on the majestic mountain. Bureau Report, Rajasabha TV. And that's all in this edition of World Panorama. But before we go, take a look at the world's tiniest baby ever to survive. The baby girl, known as uh, Sebi, weighed only 245 grams, about the same as a large apple when she was born five months ago. Sebi's mother gave birth to her in December through emergency caesarean section at 23 weeks, three days gestation in the womb, about 17 weeks earlier than the typical pregnancy. The baby girl was discharged this week from a San Diego hospital in the U.S. So take a look at the world's tiniest baby as I take your leave. I'll see you next week with another edition of the program. See you then. Bye-bye.